Hey there, BSFers. Great to have you with us again. Good news for you. If you have found this lecture, it means that you have worked your way around the My BSF shutdown. Well done. Uh, it's great uh, that we have My BSF, and I'm excited to see what My BSF 2.0 looks like. For now, we're working around a three week shutdown and we'll be ready to relaunch uh, shortly with all of the new material or everything combined in one place. Uh, I'm no techie, but I'm told it's gonna be awesome. Let's see how it goes. In the meantime, you're here, you've found this lecture, and here's another piece of good news. We have Alan Koo, substitute teaching leader, ready to bring us Matthew chapters 11 and 12. I'm gonna hand over to Alan as uh, he brings us the lecture. Thanks very much. Alan. There is someone I know who used to have long hair and he loved tying it up in a ponytail that helped him keep his hair nice and tidy. Then one day he decided not to tie his hair anymore. In fact, he decided to cut it short. That decision was made when he found out this truth that tying the hair in a ponytail increases the stress on the hair follicles and may exacerbate hair loss. You could say that the truth let his hair down a different course. Well, similarly, when we're confronted with a truth that leads to a certain consequence, it makes us take notice, assess, and hopefully respond in the right way. I know I've used a very light-hearted example here to illustrate something that is far greater importance to us than hair follicles. In fact, it is the most important decision or response which everyone must make when presented the truth. The decision has an internal impact for us. I'm talking about the truth about Jesus. Now in the preceding chapters, Matthew laid out for us who Jesus is as foretold by the prophecies, by what he taught and what he did, we saw the healing of the sick, the casting out of demons, uh, controlling of elements. Those are sufficient proof points to validate who he is. As we look into chapters 11 and 12 this week, we will see that during Jesus' time and ours, eternal, our eternal destiny is determined by our acceptance or rejection of the truth about Jesus. And we will look at our passage in three divisions. Division 1, Matthew 11, 1 to 19, Doubting Prophet. Division 2, Matthew 11, 20 to 30, Disbelieving Towns. And Division 3, Matthew chapter 12, about the dissenting leaders. So our story starts in a prison cell when John the Baptist is languishing there as a punishment for, for his denunciation of Herod Antipas' illicit marriage to his brother's wife. Now, John wasn't the type of character who wields easily under pressure. Getting his nourishment from locusts and wild honey, dressed in fancy camel hair and leather belt, he is quite an out there character who preached fearlessly and called for all people to repent. And what a moment it was for him when he got to baptize Jesus and had the first-hand experience of the Holy Trinity, of God the Father, God, God the Son, and God the Spirit. It was like a, a yes moment for him. But now, instead of God's heaven coming down from heaven and vanquishing all of God's enemies, John is seeing that Jesus is instead healing a Roman centurion's servant, Instead of gathering wheat into barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire, as we read in Matthew 3.12, Jesus is teaching the followers to be meek, merciful, and rejoice when persecuted. So John had a very different expectation of Jesus. Perhaps like the Jews of that time, he expected Jesus to deliver them from their oppressive enemies. I mean, after all, the past venerated leaders of Israel like Moses and David had done just that. Because of the uh, different expectation, doubt started to creep into John's mind. 
And I love how honest the Bible is when, when it records John's doubt for all to see. Jesus called him the greatest of prophets, and yet we see he's no different to us. This spiritual superhero doubted. And I take comfort in knowing that the best of God's people can doubt too. But what's important uh, that we do when we doubt is important. We can learn from John because he went straight to Jesus for the answer. I know in this present digital age, we have a plethora of sources of information. But be careful as many of them do not speak the truth. And that's why we gather each week to learn God's word so that we know the truth and how to apply it in our lives. John, through his disciples, asked Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Now it's interesting that Jesus doesn't give a, a yes or no answer. Jesus responds, quoting from a concatenation of phrases from Isaiah chapters 35 and 61, to point to the truth that he is the Messiah. We read in verse 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy of are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed to anyone who does not stumble on the account of me. John cites six types of miracles. It's interesting that there is no recorded miracle of blind being healed in the Old Testament. So clearly Jesus has introduced something new here. Jesus is essentially saying to John's disciples, Go back to the Word of God and look at the evidence and then answer your own question. And that's a key lesson for us when we start to doubt. Go back to the inerrant Word of God. Go back to God. Now it's okay to doubt, just like John. But when we do, we know that we can offer our doubts to God and ask Him to answer them. The danger for us though is when Satan uses doubt to distort the truth about God. In Genesis 3, we see that Satan introduced doubt into Eve's mind when he asked, Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Satan is constantly prowling for opportunities to make us lack confident in God's word and his promises. Satan is real. And his only purpose is to steal, kill and destroy. The good news, however, is that Satan is not sovereign. He does not have absolute authority and is limited by what God allows him to do. When Jesus returns to establish his eternal kingdom, Satan and his demons will forever be banished to everlasting punishment. We need to recognize the truth about Satan and be aware of his deception and rejection of Christ. But while we are aware of his devious ploys, our greater focus should remain on God, whose power and purposes cannot be thwarted by Satan or anyone for that matter. If verses 4 to 6 reveal Jesus' tact, verses 7 to 14 shows Jesus' tenderness. He turns to the crowd and affirms John's greatness, that he was indeed the forerunner of the Messiah and the last great prophet of Israel. And we will end the first division with this key truth. We can trust that God is faithful to address our doubts as we grow in faith. We can trust God is faithful to address our doubts as we grow in faith. Now we are living in a highly technologically advanced age when there is no place for the supernatural and every skepticism relies on logical and natural explanations. We can, be, we can begin to believe that there are no such things as miracles. We can believe the lie that no one can answer our faith questions, only natural explanations for the so-called miracles. 
Now John had those faith questions and he sent them directly to Jesus because he believed Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus reminded him of the signs and wonders he had performed that fulfilled prophecy about the Messiah. We can bring our faith questions to Jesus and be encouraged by the evidence found in his word. When you doubt, will you bring your faith questions to him? In our next division, Jesus calls people to believe him and warns those who reject him. Not only did Jesus speak about the greatness of John the Baptist as a prophet, Jesus also spoke like a prophet in that he warned the people of Israel that if they do not repent, great judgment will be upon them. Jesus references possibly the three top pagan sin cities that any Jew would know, Sodom, Tyre, and Sidon. And he compared them to the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, which laid north of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus warned them that they will be judged severely because they have rejected John, and now they're rejecting King Jesus himself. Now let me read to you what Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke in um, chapter 12, verse 48. From, every, from everyone who have been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. So Jesus is saying that the more revelation that we receive, the more accountable we are to that revelation. God's judgment is fair. The three cities mentioned earlier have seen a number of Jesus' miracles and yet they still didn't believe in Jesus. They thought that John the Baptist had a demon because he was a hard person who didn't know how to be merry. On the other hand, they thought Jesus was a glutton and drunkard, a bit too merry perhaps. But Jesus cut right through all the excuses for not accepting him when he said in verse 19, But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Now that means that a wise man is proved to be wise by his actions, his actions of accepting the truth about Jesus. The foolish person, on the other hand, rejects Jesus and will be condemned on judgment day. The right response to the is to acknowledge our sinfulness, repent, and then surrender fully to God. But Jesus doesn't just end with a warning and rebuke. He wants all to have a saving relationship with God. And that can only be done through Jesus, who has a special and exclusive relationship with God. So he calls and invites in verses 28 to 30. Let me again read to you. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. Jesus himself took upon the yoke of humanity by keeping the law perfectly to please God and going to the cross as the ultimate sacrifice. He's now inviting us to come to Him. We are saved not by our merits or efforts, but by faith in Jesus and His finished work on the cross. Well, let me show you what a yoke is. We'll be talking about the, the taking on the yoke of Jesus. In those days, it is a wooden appliance harnessed on the shoulders of a pair of oxen to do farm work. It's also used to train a younger ox by pairing it up with an older one, a more experienced ox, so that the, the younger ox will be led. The same way, Jesus is leading us. He's the ultimate teacher. He's our Lord. If we try to add anything to Jesus' finishes, finished work, all we are doing is placing a yoke of heavy, of, sorry, 
a, a heavy yoke of religion onto ourselves, robbing us the pure joy of being in relationship with the living God. Jesus has done all the heavy lifting, and this is Jesus' invitation. He said, come, so we must go. Yes, we, we need to move our feet to that reality. Faith is not passive. And then we take on his yoke, which is light and easy. By putting on Jesus' yoke, it means that we can't do whatever we want. You may say, well, that sounds like a, a lot of burden. It's still like a burden to me, if you say. Well, Jesus is the carpenter. So we can be assured that his yoke fits perfectly when we surrender fully to him. He is the good father who wants to lead us to an abundant life, obedient to his calling and will. Only then we can find rest for our souls. Now we land on our second key truth. Jesus alone gives eternal rest to those who surrender to his loving yoke. Jesus alone gives eternal rest to those who surrender to his loving yoke. In trying to live a fulfilling life, a life that is satisfying, we men can sometimes fill it with a lot of activities. We could travel, we could tend the garden, we could play golf, we could even volunteer in the community, we could study the stars or do rock climbing, you name it. Now, none of those activities are inherently bad. On the contrary, contrary they are good and fit a purpose. But one thing they can't do is to give us rest. They can't give us a sense of satisfaction that is complete and permanent. We can find ourselves burdened by these good activities and fail to truly see our need for rest in Christ. Now, Jesus knows that we are born with a restless striving for love and recognition that can only be found in Him. Jesus promises that all who are weary and burdened will find rest when they come to Him. So friends, will you prioritize spend investing your time in Jesus rather than a pursuit of empty activities? When the truth of Jesus is revealed to the people, there are only two types of responses. One is that you accept who He is, who he says who he is, and follow him, or to dismiss everything that he has said as false and reject Jesus completely. In our third division, we see the unbelief reach a crescendo to the point that is in the chapter uh, 12, verse 14, when the Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus. So what drove them to this decision? Well, we find that Jesus and his disciples went through the grain fields on Sabbath. Because they were hungry, the disciples picked uh, grain and ate them. According to the Pharisees, this violated the Sabbath law. Jesus then told them about the account of King David, and God's purpose for the Sabbath was always to bless humanity, not to burden the people as the Pharisees had made it all to be with their strict rules. It's meant to give life. Later, when they met Jesus at the synagogue, they tested him again by asking if it's lawful to heal a man with shriveled hand. Jesus said to the man with shriveled hand, Stretch out your hand, and his disability was instantly healed. When Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, which we looked at a few weeks ago, he said that although the law states that you shall not murder, anyone who is angry with his brother or sister is guilty of committing murder in their hearts and is subjected to the same judgment. So it's ironic that the Pharisees, who are sticklers to the externalities of the law, committed murder in their hearts and eventually they committed literal murder uh, of Jesus. By allowing their rejection of the truth of Jesus manifest into anger, which in turn manifested into murder. 
The law which God gave to Moses, or called the Mosaic Law, comprises of three components. There is the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. In fulfilling the law perfectly, Jesus showed that there is continued continuity and discontinuity of the law. What do I mean by that? The moral law is to continue, but not the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was just a shadow of better things to come. Sabbath was practiced by the Jews to not to do any work, and that really was a shadow of what is to come through Christ, the Lord of Sabbath, who blesses believers with true and complete rest. When the Pharisee, what, the, what the Pharisees had was a system of religion, or a system of worship that is based on works, and ritual. They believe that they can win God's mercy and favor through their works. That is also the natural tendency of human beings to be in control, to want to be in control and achieve a desired outcome determinist deterministically. If I do this or work harder to please God, then I will gain His favor. Friends, that is not in God's economy. Jesus is the only way to the Father, and the Pharisees failed to acknowledge that. The truth is, at the root of all unbelief, it's Satan. Satan was an angel, a creation of God, who not only rebelled against God, but mounted a revolt with a host of demons with him. They opposed God's mission, his message, and his people. By fulfilling God's law at the cross, Jesus defeated Satan in his victory over sin and death. Though defeated, Satan still prowls the earth, seeking to lie, kill, and destroy, until a time comes when Jesus returns to rule and banishes him and all those with him to eternal punishment. But take heart, because Satan is not God. He is not omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent. His influence is still limited by God. When Jesus healed the man with the shriveled head on Sabbath, it pushed the Pharisees to plot on how to kill him. Satan had played the part in fueling the, growth, the growing opposition to Jesus, which eventually culminated in his death on the cross. In verses 20 to 37, we see Jesus healing a demon-possessed man. Some were astonished, but not the Pharisees. They accused Jesus of colluding with Satan. They surmised Jesus' ability to heal came from Satan. The, Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict people of Christ. But when truth is permanently rejected, that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus warned in verse 31 that there is no forgiveness for that. Well, you may think, well, I, I still sin even though I've been warned or directed not to by the Holy Spirit. Does that mean there is no forgiveness? I believe Jesus was talking about the condition of a person where the mind is so depraved to the extent that it causes the perversion of truth. Wrong is called right. Right is called wrong. Truth is called lies. God revealed the reality of who Jesus is through his words and his works. If anyone rejects this manifestation of God's Holy Spirit and the power and attributes it to Satan, then he is rejecting salvation and ultimately God. So back to the question, if you're thinking about your sin and are affected by it, that means there is hope. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He, meaning God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And as one Bible teacher pointed out, the, the warning in verses 31 to 32 becomes a reality for those who have distorted the truth 
to the point of remo- removing any awareness of their need for forgiveness. Jesus' death on the cross covered every sin of those who, find, who finds rest in him. It covers, it covers our, our past, our present, and future sins. So I urge you, friends, to go to God to confess your sins and repent. In verses 32 to 37, Jesus warns us against using our words in an idle manner because our words reveal what's really inside our hearts. Therefore, a careless word may be a basis of God's judgment. With each encounter with Jesus, the hearts of the Pharisees became harder and harder. They chose not to believe in Jesus. In verses 38 to 45, they wanted a sign and have asked for it to be to be uh, sorry, have asked for it so that it became an evidence on, of their unbelief. They wanted Jesus to prove that he was the Messiah. One commentator wrote, For Jesus to have given them a sign would have been wrong. He would have catered to their unbelief and allowed them to set the standards for faith. The only sign Jesus would give them was the sign of the prophet of Jonah, who was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights. Jonah's miraculous escape authenticated his mission from God. The resurrection of Jesus did the same. He spent three days and three nights in the grave. Here's the truth about Jesus. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. He's the Messiah, God's chosen one, who delivers and redeems those who believe in him from sin and death through his death and resurrection. Our eternal destiny is determined by this truth. Our relationship to this truth will determine where we will spend all eternity. Our relationship to this truth will chart the course of our lives in this world. Our relation to this truth will define our family. Just as Jesus puts it in verses 48 to 50, he said, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And here's our last key truth. Believing in and following Jesus means enjoying a relationship with the living God and his family on earth and for eternity. I'll repeat. Believing in and following Jesus means enjoying a relationship with the living God and his family on earth and for eternity. When we are confronted with the truth about Jesus, we are only left with two choices, to believe and follow him or not. Even indifference is a choice. It's a choice against Jesus. The only choice that we need to make is to believe in him. And that leads to a life of true joy and perfect rest for our time on earth and a glorious time of eternity with him. You and I have made a decision, sorry, you and I may have made a decision to follow Christ, but there are many others who haven't. If I may leave you with a challenge, please read your notes this week especially in the Applied section. It reads, If we have not personally invested in people who have rejected the truth, we have not shared our faith enough. So who do you, who do you know that continues to reject the gospel? How will you pray for them? Well, we are here because others have gone before us to share the good news of Jesus. The gospel is meant to be proclaimed and shared. So may I ask that you start praying for one person, just one person whom you know have, who have not accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just one. Let me close in prayer. Father Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for the truth about Jesus that Jesus is the only way to you, and he's the truth and life. 
Lord, thank you that you bring us this truth this week. And Lord, may you challenge us, Lord. May you challenge us to really be the, your eyes, your hands and feet in the world. That we look out for those who have not accepted this truth. And Lord, that we reach out to them. And for us who have, Lord, may we rest completely in you, Lord. May we surrender to you, for your yoke is easy and light. And Lord, thank you for granting us your rest, which is perfect. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.